We're so glad you're here today in the name of Jesus. When uh, Pastor Ronnie was uh, going to continue his teaching tonight, but uh, he had to take his wife to Houston, kind of a little bit of an uh, emergency there they needed to take care of with his wife. And so as we um, get started today, I want to lift him up in prayer in the name of the Lord. If you join me. As we come before the Lord, thank you, Father, tonight for this opportunity that you give us to gather together as your people. We thank you for Jesus, all that he has accomplished for us, that we may be able to know such a holy God as you. Thank you, Lord. Tonight we lift up Ronnie and Rebecca to you there in Houston, Father. I pray right now in Jesus' name that you will sustain uh, Rebecca, that you will work out, Lord, all the things that need to be accomplished there in uh, the administration of her health. And I thank you, Father, for being there, a present help in time of need, as your word says. And we thank you, Lord, for giving them uh, encouragement. And Lord, knowing that your people here remember them in prayer and in intercession. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to James chapter 1. And also, if you'll find Luke, the 21st chapter. James chapter 1. And Luke, the 21st chapter. And I want to share with you tonight, I think, something that the Bible continually encourages us and warns us about. And something that I think is so necessary for us to not lose sight of in the last days that we're living in before the coming of the Lord. Because it is such an important um, a topic uh, that is taken up not only by the Lord himself, but by the writers of Scripture uh, in James chapter 1, in verse 16, James writes this, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. And then in verse 22 he says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So uh, James says here in verse 16 that we are to be careful that we are not deceived. In other words, that no one comes to us and attempts to deceive us. It is a warning against deception or being deceived by, as we're going to see tonight, many deceivers in the world. But in verse 22, he tells us that there's another kind of deception that we need to be aware of, and that's self-deception. Be, be, he says, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves not doing the word of God not being those who take the word of God seriously and live by it is a self deceptive um, attitude that we're to guard against uh, we're to study the scripture we're to meditate the scripture we're to know the scripture this the Bible tells us that we ought to be students of the word so James tells us that we need to be careful that we not just be hearers of the word, that we not just listen to the word. And uh, as much as we might like, you know, the message and the word, uh, Jesus gave a parable in Mark, I think it's the fourth chapter, in Luke, the eighth chapter, the parable of the sower. You remember that where he says that uh, there are people that receive the word with joy. Uh, but afterwards... Uh, when affliction or persecution arise, they fall away. And so you can have uh, a joy in hearing the word, and it might be uh, something that ministers to your soul, but if you don't do it, then James goes on to say that you deceive yourself. You're like a man who sees himself in the mirror, and then he goes, and he goes away he says, and forgets what kind of man he was. In other words, he forgets what he saw. Uh, because he is a hearer only and not a doer. And so we are to be careful that we are not deceived, and we are to be careful that we don't deceive ourselves. And uh, the Bible speaks uh, many, many different times and ways uh, to warn us about deception. And there's clear admonition all over the Scripture and sometimes even by graphic example where God repeatedly calls us to be on guard against believing lies. Everybody say lies. 
Because that's what deception is. It's believing what is not true. It is embracing that which is not true. And one of the greatest works of the enemy of our soul, one of the greatest works that Satan tries to bring against the church is deception. So the Lord repeatedly warns us in the scripture about this idea of deception. In Luke chapter 21, Luke 21 and verse 18, I think I told you to find Luke, right? Luke 21 and verse 18, excuse me, verse 8, Jesus says this. Take heed, he said, that you be not deceived. Again, deceived by others, right? For many will come in my name saying, I am he, and the time has drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. So Jesus warns his disciples, warns us as well, that we ought to take heed that we do not follow a Jesus, all right, that is not the true Jesus. Because he says in the last days, notice, many will come in my name, saying, I am he. There are so many messiahs all over the world, all over, people, all over the place, uh, that are proclaiming that they are the, either the representation of Jesus or that they are uh, Jesus himself. And uh, Jesus warns us here. So evidently, it is possible that we could fall into a deception where Jesus is concerned. That we follow the right Jesus, that we follow the Bible Jesus. Because he said, many are going to come in my name. In other words, this isn't a deception away from Christianity. This is a deception within what we would call Christianity. Because they're coming in the name of Jesus. They're coming representing or saying that they're representing Jesus and that the time is drawing near. And Jesus says, therefore, do not go after them. Notice he began by saying, be careful, take heed, that you be not deceived, don't go after them. All right, because there's really only one Jesus, amen? The real Jesus. Remember that show many, many years ago? Um, um, what was the name of that show? Where people would impersonate each other and, and then finally somebody said, well, the real, you know, the real Jesus stand up, all right? And you had to figure out who was the real one by the questions and answers that were given. Well, we have in the Bible the real Jesus. We have in the Bible explained for us who Christ is, what he does, how he thinks, and how he acts. In Romans chapter 7, let's go over there, we find the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7 describing the role of deception in, in when he was lost in his spiritual bondage. And he says in verse 11 of Romans 7, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. In other words, Paul here is saying that the law, which God had given the law of Moses, was good. But sin used the commandments, he says, to deceive me, and by it killed me. And so he describes the role of deception even in his spiritual bondage, right? Right? And how many people today attempt to get into a right standing with God by their own works, by the law? Paul tried to do that all his religious life. And he says, but sin hadn't been dealt with, so sin deceived me. Now, the law didn't deceive him. Sin deceived him. And he says, and killed me. So we see that even when we were lost, the religious ideas that Paul and many others have had right, of wanting to get right with God by their own works, is a deception. And then in Galatians chapter 6, let's go to Galatians, the book of Galatians after the book of Corinthians, right, Galatians, and then Ephesians. So let's go to Galatians chapter 6, Paul here writes to the Galatian Christians, and he says in verse 7, do not be deceived, again, another warning here, God is not what? mocked for whatever a man sows that will he also reap so Paul warns uh, those who think they can get away with sin don't be deceived All right and how many people even some so-called Christians right think well well you know I don't think this is a big deal even though the Bible says it's wrong to do it but you know I've been doing it a long time and nothing's happened 
And, and so, you know, I, I, I just think it's okay. I don't think God's so concerned about this. If God says something in the Bible is wrong, you better make sure, you better, I mean, you better know that he means it. All right? So he says, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked because whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Now, oftentimes, you know, we think we're the exception, right? Christians think, well, yeah, I know that's happened to other people, but it's not going to happen to me. Right? I, I'm too smart for that. Uh, I know that other people have gone down that path and I've seen what has happened to them, but I think I'm a little bit smarter. Well, if you're smarter than God, go for it. But you're not. And so Paul says, don't be deceived. Right? Whatever you sow, you are going to reap. The law applies to everybody. Now, it might take a little bit longer for you to reap. You might say, well, I've been doing this for a long time. Nothing's happened. But God said, don't be deceived. Because whatever you sow, it's going to come up. And if you sow to the flesh, what does the Bible say? You will reap corruption. All right, so we cannot be people who operate in the flesh and think it's okay because we've done it for a long time and nothing's happened. We're actually sowing seeds of our own destruction. So God is serious when he says, you are going to reap what you sow. And that's a law. If you don't believe that, you're deceived. So don't be deceived, Paul says. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, now kind of thinking in line with that about not being deceived by what we sow. There again, there are people who think that it really doesn't matter because we're saved by grace anyway, that it really doesn't matter, you know, kind of what you do after you're saved because uh, after all, God saved us by grace and it's not. And so they, they think it's okay to live in such a way that displeases God. Uh, but Paul here says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be, what? Deceived. Deceived. Again, another warning. Why? Because if you live an unrighteous life, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Because the unrighteousness in your life that you're manifesting is an evidence of something. It's not an evidence of godliness. It's not an evidence of you walking in the path of righteousness, right? Because God will always lead us in the paths of righteousness. I remember many years ago, uh, I was counseling with this man and he said, well, you know, uh, I think that the Lord um, uh, is allowing me to go through this uh, for something good. And what he was going through was sin, was sinful. And I said, no, God, doesn't, God will not leave you, lead you down a path of sin. First of all, God cannot be tempted with evil. He doesn't tempt people with evil. And God leads you, the Bible says, in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Because God honors his own name and sanctifies his name, he will never, ever stain his name by leading you down, in his name, down a path that is evil. And so Paul says here, don't you know that unrighteous people will not inherit the kingdom of God? Right? So what, is hap what, what has to happen to unrighteous people? Well, they have to be sanctified, right? And change from unrighteous to saints, to righteous. Now, that doesn't mean that you do everything perfect, but your heart has been changed so that now your desire is to walk in righteousness. And I always tell people, if you have no desire to live righteously, it's because you're not saved. Because the righteousness that Christ brings into our life changes our appetite, changes our desire. Now, oftentimes we stumble and we fail and we get up and we repent. But we know that what we did was wrong and we're headed back into the path of righteousness. So Paul says here, don't, he says, don't be deceived. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he describes what that unrighteousness looks like. Fornicators. All right. I remember many, many years ago, there were the children of God. Some of you might remember that. Uh, children of God or these young people went out, you know, and uh, fornicated for Jesus. You think I'm making it up? I'm not. These young ladies said, you know, uh, we, we have to love people into the kingdom of God. So they went and fornicated with guys to bring them into Jesus. <laughs> well, fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of God. Idolaters won't. Adulterers won't. Homosexuals won't. 
You see, today people saying, well, you know, um, it's just a different lifestyle, Pastor Danny, you know, and it's just, you know, it doesn't really matter who you love. Well, it sure does. Because you can be in love with the devil. <laughs> it does matter if you love the devil, don't, right? Yeah, of course. So Paul says here, don't be deceived. Fornicators aren't going to enter the kingdom. You know, you make all kinds of excuses. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, I don't know how many uh, times we've, we've come across people, you know, they, they, well, you know, we never got married. We're just kind of living together. And, uh, you know, we, we feel like we're married. We've had children. Well, you're fornicating. Because if you haven't made a covenant of marriage before God, you need to. And there are people that, you know, that just out of the fact that that's how they were living, they came to Christ and all of a sudden we've realized, you know, ah, I've, got to, I've got to remedy this because it's not right. The unrighteous will not inherit. So we've had them get married. We've had them take that step of, of getting married. We've, we've had people, you know, young people and we've had people that have, that have been already up in age, all of their children grown and everything and never got married. Somebody said, well, God doesn't really care. After all, you've already had children. Of course he does. Because fornicators and adulterers will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And if that's how you're living, guess what? You need to repent. Homosexuals. You know, today we think, well, you know, we've got to affirm people, you know, the LGBT community, you know, uh, they all fall into this deception. Now you might say, well, I have friends and family that are involved in the LGBT community. Well, you need to pray for them. Because homosexuals will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And all immoral people, and basically here he's talking about sexual immorality. Notice, it's just not homosexuals. It's fornicators. It's adulterers. All right? Nor sodomites. And he says, none of these will enter the kingdom of heaven. Don't you know that? Verse 10, he says, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. But again, Paul says in verse 9, do not be deceived because deception is the thing that the enemy uses to keep people bound and out of the kingdom. Amen? Now look at 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, again, Paul gives us another warning. And again, you see this all throughout the scripture. There are so many, many other scriptures that we could read about deception. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33, Paul says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Evil company corrupts good habits. And other people say, well, you know, Pastor, I, I'm a Christian. I have friends, you know, they, 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 they don't know the Lord. And, you know, but, but they're my good friends and I spend my time with them. Yeah, they drink and cuss and, you know, they, they live in a way that's not pleasing to God. But, uh, you know, but I like them because they're my friends. Well, where are those friends going to take? If you're not having an impact on them for Christ, Paul said, don't be deceived because evil company will corrupt your good habits. People who are corrupt and you spend time with them, they will eventually, unless you're mature and you can stand and you can uh, give testimony of your faith to them, they will end up corrupting the good that you have. So, I mean, if you know, if you have a bunch of good apples and you have a bad apple and you put them all together, the apples will all become bad eventually, right? Because that one will begin to spread its rottenness to the others, right? So don't be deceived. It matters who you keep company with. It matters who you are hanging around with. I remember as a young man, my mom would say, uh, you know, uh, she, there are certain characters that she didn't really like me to hang around. She says, you don't need to hang around with those kids. But they're my friends. <laughs> and I remember my mom used to say, yeah, but eventually they're going to take you down the path that they're going. Of course, you know, as a young man, I wasn't really even saved, but she was trying to protect me. And you ought to do that. You ought to do that for your kids. You ought to, you ought to, you ought to know who they're associating with, especially today, especially now. Because they could be teaching them things that you don't even know they're learning from people who have uh, evil as the foundation of their life because they don't know the Lord. Not just so much because they're, you know, they're bad people in themselves. They're just overcome with evil. And people who don't know the Lord, you know, they, they have a corrupt heart. That's the basic foundation of Scripture, right? All people are corrupt 
at, in, the, in their heart because they're sinners. It isn't until we come to Christ that God changes our heart and we begin to see evil in a different light. And so Paul says, don't be deceived because evil company can corrupt good habits. Now go to 2 Corinthians. You're there in 1 Corinthians. Go to the next book in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. In verse 3, Paul here says, I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And so Paul had a concern for the Corinthian church and he said, uh, I am uh, fearful, I am, I am uh, concerned that like the devil deceived Eve by his craftiness. He said, so your minds may be corrupted by the same craftiness and moved away from the simplicity that is in Christ. You know, there's so much to learn in the scripture about the Lord, about Christ. But really, knowing Christ is simple. There's a simplicity to a relationship. He loves you and he wants you to love him. I, that's simple. That's a simple relational uh, uh, aspect of our, of our union with Christ. Is to know him. He already knows us in salvation. But we want to get to know him more. And so we have to be careful that we don't allow the simplicity of Christ to get away from us. That we make it complicated. Uh, one of the things and values that we have here at Grace Point is that we say we want to make it easy for people to connect with God and connect with others. All right? We want to make it easy. We don't, want to, we don't want to have a bunch of hoops they have to run through in order to be able to do that. As a matter of fact, when people come to Grace Point and they know the Lord and they want to serve, you know, we want everybody to, to go through a certain process, uh, you know, uh, take our membership class so they know what our church is about. What are they, you know, uh, joining? Uh, and we want them to uh, eventually come and serve. But if someone already knows the Lord and they might have not have gone through the membership class, but they want to serve. Well, we don't mind. We let them serve. We say, come on in. And with time, you'll be able to take the class. And uh, in other words, we don't have a certain order. So, well, you haven't taken the class, so you can't do anything. No. Because there is a simplicity to serving Christ. Come on. And so Paul says here, be, I, I don't want you to be deceived uh, and moved away from that simplicity that is in Christ. Like the serpent deceived Eve with his craftiness. So we don't try to be crafty here. We just want people to connect with the Lord and connect with one another. Amen. Uh, in uh, Titus chapter 3, let's go over to the book of Titus. The book of Titus is after the books of Timothy. And the epistle to Titus in chapter 3. Here, um, Paul is writing to Titus. And uh, he is telling Titus that this is the very condition out of which the Lord took us out of and converted us when we came to Christ. And that was deception. Notice, for we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, and deceived. Paul recognizes that. We were there in that condition. We were deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So we were, we were delivered from that condition as sinners that we lived in, and that was that we were deceived. Now, uh, we would never admit that we were deceived, but Paul says, because we didn't know the truth about God, we were believing lies. Remember I said at the beginning that deception is believing lies. Living your life based on a lie. Thinking that you're okay when you're not. When God says that outside of Christ you are on your way to eternal judgment and you might just sh shrug that off and say, well, I don't believe that. Well, that's because you're deceived, right? You don't know any better. And so we're living our lives, Paul said, before we came to Christ, foolishly, disobedient. Right? We were serving lusts and pleasures. We were living in malice and envy and hateful and hating one another. But we were deceived. We were a deceived people. Now in Revelation chapter 20, there's another warning. I want you to go there with me. Revelation chapter 20. That's the last book of the Bible. And verse 7. Let's look at that. And here, John describes for us the deception that the devil uses 
And he tells us that this deception is the devil's design for the nations. Notice Revelation 20, verse 7. He says, now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and he will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. So Satan, he said at the end time, uh, after the millennial kingdom, will go out, he says, to deceive the nations. This is his... Uh, uh, his MO, this is what his design is, to deceive nations. And then in verse 10, the devil who deceived them, he says, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the devil who is the deceiver, right? Jesus said he is the father of lies, right? He himself will be judged by God uh, and cast into the lake of fire, where not only he, but all the angels that followed him and all uh, uh, unbelievers in Christ will also spend their time with their father. Praise God, we don't have to go there if, we're, if we know Christ, amen? Uh, so the devil is a deceiver and he will go out to deceive the nations and he is even doing that even now to a certain extent. Uh, his design is that all would live uh, by the lies that will ultimately damn them. So this is just a mere sample of what the scripture tells us in, in the year of warning in deception. And deception is very deadly. It is spiritually deadly because at every point you're believing lies. And when you believe lies, you cannot believe the truth. And the truth is what sets us free. See, if you live a lie, you can never be free. You'll always be bound by that lie. That's what Paul was saying. I'm concerned for you that you would uh, be moved from the simplicity of Christ. We read there in 1 Corinthians, or in 2 Corinthians. So Paul uh, and, and Jesus and the apostles warn us about the deception and the importance of understanding how deadly it can be. Because if you believe a lie, you can't believe the truth again. And the truth, one, liberates us, sets us free, says John 8, 32. But in John 17, verse 17, we find another thing that the truth does. And Jesus says that it, 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 the truth sanctifies us. This is what his prayer is to the Father. Sanctify them, speaking of the disciples, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So deception keeps us in lies and doesn't set us, up, set us apart for God. We begin to live uh, for our own sin and our own deception. And we can never be free again because it is the truth that liberates us. We cannot be sanctified if we are deceived and living a lie. If we know what the word says, but we don't do it. So deception can be very dangerous. Self-deception can be very disastrous to you. Self-deception is destructive and it is hard really to detect. As a matter of fact, this is a very important point in understanding deception. There's a lot of warning we just read in the scripture. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Deception is hard to detect, but it's even harder to eliminate. Because when you're deceived, you don't know that you are. That's why it's insidious. Um, have you ever met anybody who... But confessed or believed that they were deceived? No. Nobody goes around and says, well, yeah, I know I'm, I know I'm deceived, but it's okay. <laughs> no. Mostly, if, you know, when people are deceived, they don't know it. Now, other people might be able to see it, but it takes the revelation of God and the truth of God to show you a deception. That's why I've said it can be very deadly because oftentimes we can be deceived uh, you see, as Christians, we can be deceived. Yes, that's why we have all the warnings. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Be careful, Jesus said, in the last days. There's going to come other people in my name. Don't go after them. Know who I am. Because deception, again, nobody ever admits that they're deceived. And the reason we don't is because of our ego. All right? We don't want to admit that we have been bamboozled. <laughs> Right? That we have been deceived. 
And oftentimes I said others can see it uh, before we do. And uh, the reason I think that self-deception uh, emerges oftentimes uh, in our life is because we live uh, self-referential lives. Uh, in other words, we begin to compare ourselves by ourselves. Um, and so we think, well, we're not too bad. I mean, I know some really bad people. And uh, I know some people to do some really wicked things. And this the particular thing that I'm doing is not that bad. right? Uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, look at this with me. So self-deception emerges from, I said, living on a self-referential basis. Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, what does he say? Are not wise. So people who compare themselves by themselves, they become the standard or they compare themselves to others, Paul says, are not wise. And so there is oftentimes where self-deception emerges in people's lives. And in any, any of our lives it can be. Because we begin to set a reference that is not wise to set. Maybe other people. You know, well, you know, I'm just doing what, you know, brother so-and-so is doing. He's doing it. Yeah, but it's what brother so-and-so is doing. It. Is, it, is it right? Not just because... You know, well, he's a Christian, and so he's doing it, and it's okay. And so living a self-referential life where you compare yourself by yourself or with, with others, Paul says, is not wise. And it's a way into deception. Now, go back again to Revelation, the last book of the Bible. Let's go to chapter 3. And here we find Jesus uh, pointing out a problem, the two of the churches here in Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. And verse 17, Jesus said of the church of the Laodiceans, uh, remember he's the one that, this is the church he told him, well, you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. I'm going to vomit you out. Verse 17, because you say, I am rich, I become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. So here's a church that, commends itself um, by several characteristics, richness, wealth, no lack. And you do not know, Jesus said, that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They were believing what? Lies. I mean, they, they believed their own press reports, right? Their evaluation of themselves was radically different than Jesus' evaluation of them. And I wonder when Jesus looks at our church, what does he see? How do we evaluate ourselves? Well, we, we compare ourselves with someone else or maybe, you know, how does Jesus look at us? That's a very important thing. How does Jesus look at you as an individual or us as a church or you as a family? You say, well, we're not too bad. You know, we're actually pretty good. I think, I think we, you know, we're getting along here pretty well. But Jesus looks at you and says, wait, 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 wait. You don't know. Isn't that terrible? To have an opinion of yourself when totally opposite of the opinion that the Lord has? Because what you're doing isn't pleasing to the Lord? How you're living isn't pleasing to God? He said, wait a minute, you're poor. You say you're rich, but you're not. You're poor. Right? You become wealthy. No, you're miserable. You're blind. You're naked. So you can be wealthy, have all things, you know, nice to wear. But God says, well, in my sight, you're, that's not who you are. So self-deception can be, again, very dangerous. I pray that we would seek always to, to not self-reference ourselves, because, again, that's not wise. But actually look to the Lord. How do you see me, Lord? What area in my life do I need to focus on that I haven't seen 
David used to pray, Lord, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things out of your law. Let me see the things that I don't see. And then in verse one of Revelation three there, there's another church here, the church of Sardis. And it says, and the angel of the church of Sardis write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you're alive. Here's a church that's known for being alive. Man, we're alive. We got it going, brother. Except Jesus said, no, you're dead. <laughs> Can someone be dead and think they're alive? Remember that movie, The Walking Dead? <laughs> they, they thought they were alive, right? They were walking around, you know, oozing all over the place, you know. I don't even know why I used that example, but it's a bad example. <laughs> but here's a church that says, man, we got a name. We're known, right? Man, you go to a city, what church is alive? Man, go to that church, it's, a, it's alive. Well, is it? Here's a church, I know your works. You have a name. You have a name that you're alive. But my estimation of you is different. So here's a church that was living a lie. The Lord said, you're dead. So he calls them to repent. They were a model church, but they were dead. So as we read about deception in the scripture, and there's, again, you can go back and look at your concordance and you can find a whole lot of other things that the Bible says about deception. So knowing this, knowing the warnings are there, what are our takeaways? What do we learn from this? I think that one of the things is that I don't care how mature you think you are or experienced as a believer or accomplished as a church we need to have an extreme humility where our lives are concerned before God and say God when I think I'm pretty good man will you examine me <laughs> will you examine me because I want to stand in a place where I am honoring you I don't want to be deceived I don't want to have a, an opinion of myself, especially because I might look at somebody else and say, man, they're really doing bad, so I'm not doing too, you know, too bad. Remember, those who compare themselves to themselves are not wise. Our comparison isn't with another church or another person. It's with the Lord. Amen. He's our standard. Can you say amen? amen? Go to Proverbs 27 for a moment. What other takeaway do we have? Well, we need extreme humility. We need to be brought also to a commitment, a radical commitment, where we measure our lives by what the scripture tells us that we're called to do and to be, and by nothing else. What does the scripture tell me that I am to be? And right off the bat, one of the most important things Paul talked about in Romans chapter 8 is that we are called to be conformed to the image of Jesus. How close are you? How close am I? And what areas in my life, honestly, can I examine and say, man, this, this here, this area of my life is so lacking. <laughs> but not use it as an excuse to say, well, I'm only human. No. Because that's deception. God has called us to be like Jesus. His whole goal in your life is to make you more like Christ. He has predestined you to be conformed to the image of Christ. In the way you think, in the way you act, in the way you talk, in the way you treat other people. And all of us need an extreme humility when it comes to that. So we are to measure our lives by what the scripture tells us is honoring to God. Another thing I think is important for us as we think about deception and self-deception is that it ought to make us willing to listen to criticism 
And don't miss this, especially from those who oppose us. Especially from those who might not even like us. And I'll tell you why. Because they're not concerned about our feelings. Like our friends. And often our friends will be concerned about our feelings and so they won't be completely honest with us. And so when you have somebody that you know treats you as an enemy and talks about you, ask yourself, is there any truth to what they're saying? They're accusing me of being bigoted, hateful. But before you say, I'm not a none of those things, ask yourself, are they seeing something that I'm not seeing? And so sometimes some of the greatest benefits I think that I have received in my spiritual life and help have come from those who attacked me and didn't like me. It hurt. It didn't feel good. But sometimes I have to say, Lord, am I just making an excuse because I don't want to face the fact of what they're seeing in me? And so... It ought to be something that we're willing to do. Listen to criticism of those who openly oppose you. Again, they have no interest in sparing your feelings. And finally, I think we need to make ourselves accountable to avoid deception to real friends. And when I say real friends, I'm talking about people who will tell you the truth. And they're not concerned so much primarily with the friendship or hurting your feelings, but loving you, that they will tell you the truth. I said before, and I think this is worth mentioning again, that if you have people who are your friends, but you will not tell them the truth because you're afraid to lose their friendship, it just signals that you care more about the friendship than you care about them. And you need to be willing to say, at the cost of losing our friendship, I need to tell you the truth. So we need friends who will not hold back, will not just pat us on the back and have yes men for friends. In Proverbs 27, verse 5, Solomon writes, open rebuke. Is better than love carefully concealed. Hmm. Open rebuke is better than a love that is concealed. Verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You see the deception there. But he says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. I don't know about you, I can speak only for myself, but I have had friends who have wounded me and have helped me. And like any wound, it doesn't feel good. But because we want to please God, oftentimes God will even use those. And we might even be perturbed with our friend might not even want to talk to them anymore, but God can even use a friend who will say, listen, I know this is going to hurt you, but you need to hear it. In Psalm 139, we've shared this with you a couple of weeks ago on Sunday morning. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit in our life. And... Uh, this is a prayer that David prayed in Psalm 139, verse 23, where he ends this psalm by saying, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Now, why would God, I mean, why would David ask God to know his heart? Because he knows that he doesn't know it. That is, David doesn't know his own heart. And oftentimes we, we fall in that same place. We think we know, but we don't even know our own thought, our own heart. God knows everything about what we're going to do and think and say and the steps we're going to take. And so David says, Lord, will you search my heart? 
and know it. And he says, try me, test me, and know my anxieties. See, oftentimes we, we carry anxieties, we carry worries and fears, and we don't even know why. We think we do. But it takes a revelation from God because he loves you and cares for you that you would go and say, Lord, will you test my heart? Am I really doing this for the right reason, for the right motive? And that's a prayer that has as its goal to please God. And he says, and by the way, when you search me and try me and know my anxieties, my anxious thoughts, see if there's any wickedness in me. <laughs> Think about that. Would there be any wickedness in me that I don't know? Well, David's thought so. He didn't say, well, Lord, search my heart. and I know you're not going to find any wickedness there because I don't have any. <laughs> but say, Lord, and especially, listen, especially when you've had a fallout with people. Instead of feeling self-righteous, and we all carry that, you know, I was right and they were wrong, that I would say, Lord, there's conflict here, and where there is conflict, there's always a, a probability that there's evil, or at least deception. And say, Lord, I had a falling out. Will you check my heart? If there's anything wicked in there, will you just show it to me so that I can repent of it? And as you begin to walk that way with God in humility, listen, you know what God does with humble people? He exalts them. That's what the Bible says. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. And that's the truth and you have to believe that. If you don't, you don't believe that of God, then you're deceived. Because you're believing a lie. You're believing that's not true. And God said, if you'll humble yourself, I will exalt you. In Mark chapter 13, go over to Mark. You know, there's an ever present danger of self deception. And because it is ever present, you know what that ought to do? It ought to get us running to Jesus. Because he's the shepherd of our soul, isn't he? Amen. But in Mark chapter 13, uh, beginning at verse 5. Mark 13, verse 5. The disciples are asking him here about the end times. What is going to be the sign, Lord, when all these things are going to happen? And Jesus answered them, verse 5. Began, Jesus answering them began to say, take heed that no one deceives you. Again. Be careful that no one deceives you. Now, if Jesus says, take care that no one deceives you, there is a possibility that you can be, right? Else he wouldn't warn us about it. So he says, be careful that no one deceives you, that you're not deceived. For many will come in my name, saying again, I, will, I am he, and will deceive many. There are going to be many Jesuses that are going to emerge in the last day. So he says, listen, this is an ever-present danger. So be careful. Make sure that the Jesus that you're following and that you worship is the real Jesus. And the reason that is so important, and again, I'll remind you of this. I've said this so, so many times from this pulpit, is, is because Jesus said that in the kingdom of God, there's a wheat that is growing, but alongside the wheat, there are tares. Everything that looks like wheat isn't wheat. And Jesus said, there are many in that day who are going to say to me, Lord, Lord, again, identifying with Jesus, Christian, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do these wonderful things in your name? Jesus will turn to them and say, depart from me, I never knew you. That is why it's so important that you know the real Jesus. Because there's going to be many involved within the Christian environment, even calling Jesus Lord. But again, 
The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus said, get away from me, you workers of iniquity. So people today, they're in church and they think, well, you know, they can be adult, adulterers and idolaters and fornicators and homosexuals. And, uh, you know, there's this big argument uh, that was going on back, uh, I guess about two years ago, I was reading and there's a kind of, can a Christian be a homosexual, a practicing homosexual? I said, you might as well ask, well, can a Christian be an adulterer? <laughs> All right? I mean, it's, it's a perversion of sexuality, isn't it? Yeah. Or can a person live in fornication and be a Christian? So today, because people want to affirm people's sexuality, which by the way, um, anybody who thinks their sexuality is what defines them is deceived because you're not your sexuality. You're a whole lot more than that. You know, sexuality, God created as a sexual being. Sexuality is, a, is an appetite like eating Imagine we say, well, I'm a burger guy. That's my identity. I eat burgers all the time. So call me Mr. Burger. Because that's my preferred pronoun or what? Some crazy thing like that. And that's what's going on. That's foolishness going on in the world today. That's deception. Someone asked me sometime back, says, well, what if you had a, a child in your family there, or a granddaughter or grandchild who, was, uh, who came out and, and said they were gay? What would you tell them? I would tell them that they're not gay, they're not homosexual. I would tell them your sexuality is perverted because you're a sinner. Your identity comes from God, from who God made you. And God made you a human being with many different needs, not just one. And so that can't define you. And what a person needs when they've fallen into a deception, whether it's sexual or addictive in some way or to some kind of, uh, whether it's alcohol or drugs or whatever it is, only Christ can deliver from that. But to affirm and to say, well, that's just the way they are. Well, I always tell people, that's the way you are because you're a sinner. And that's why you need to be born again. You need a whole new makeover. And that's the message of the gospel. The Lord comes to make people all over again. And so here in Mark Jesus said, be careful that you're not deceived. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 13, Paul says that the problem of deception is a problem that we're going to deal constantly. And it's going to be threatening to us until Jesus comes back. Notice he says, evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. So deception, right, the deception that the enemy is, is coming, uh, bringing to the world to deceive the nations, it's just going to get worse and worse. So I don't look for the world to get any better. I look for it to get worse. Jesus said the love of many would grow cold in the last days because iniquity would abound. Because iniquity abounds, the love of many would grow cold. Paul says here, evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse. Why? Because Deception is going to run rampant. But not only are they going to deceive, but they're going to be deceived. And that's why the Bible warns us as believers to not be deceived. That we ought to be and live sober lives before the Lord. In Mark chapter 13, go back there again. We just finished reading verse 5 and 6, but I want to read verse 10. For Mark 13, verse 10. Listen to this. Jesus talked about, remember he said, take heed that no one deceives you. Verse 5. 
In verse 10, he says, the gospel must first be preached to all nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. For whatever is given to you in that hour, speak that, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. In other words, Christians in the last time need a relationship, an intimacy, a close relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because he said in these times of deception, he said you're going to be persecuted and you're going to be brought, right, to, to answer, to be delivered before councils. And don't premeditate, he said, what you're going to say because the Holy Spirit will tell you what you ought to speak. Verse 12. Now brother will betray brother to death, uh, will betray brother to death and a father his child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Now think about that. A brother will betray another brother to death. A father will give up his child. Children will rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. How drastic is the end time? How, think about that. We don't normally think, oh, oh, my kids would give me up to death? <laughs> I say, that's so far out of our mind, we would we never think, what? Really? That could happen? Well, this happened before. You know, under the Nazi re regime, the, the, the children would turn their parents in. Why? Because they had been deceived into an ideology that they believed was true, and it was a lie. And so if they didn't follow the, you know, the accepted state religion, the children would turn their parents in. Well, our parents are, are Jews or are Christians or whatever. Well, Jesus said in the last days, listen, there's going to be so much deception. There's going to be all these different things that are going to be happening that children, parents will betray each other. Think about how terrible society must be for that to happen. But Jesus said, be careful. These deceptions will lead even close families to betray each other. So we need God's protection at every turn, don't we? Especially as we head into the end times. And our only hope and our only certain supply is Christ and His righteousness and living in the way that Christ died so that we could live. And that is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we need to learn to walk by the Holy Spirit. I think one of the reasons God... Uh, gave me the instruction to teach on the Holy Spirit is because I believe that as we draw closer to the Lord, or to the end times, we need to know how to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. We need to learn from Him because He'll keep us from deception. And uh, if you develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit, you'll always be close to the Lord. Jesus said, if any man is willing to do God's will, he will know, listen, if what I'm teaching is true or not. How do you know that what you're believing and you're living is true? This is ought to be the attitude of your heart, Jesus said, if you're willing to do his will. Before you even know all there is in here, you begin by saying, God, whatever you show me in here, I'll do. Somebody said, well, what is he going to show me? Well, he's going to show you everything, first of all, that you need to become more like Jesus. You say, well, I want to know what it is first before I agree to do it. Well, then you won't know it. Because Jesus said, if any man is willing to do his will, he will know. So the prerequisite, are you willing to do what God shows you that you are to do in his word? And if you begin with that, and say, Lord, as I read the scripture and meditate on it, whatever you show me that I need to do, I'm going to do that. That attitude, I can guarantee you, will open the door to understanding and revelation in the word. God will show you truth and he will keep you from being deceived. Because it isn't a matter of just being smart. Again, deception by nature is that you don't know you're deceived.
But if God can keep you from walking into deception because you're walking in intimacy with him and in obedience to his word, not being a hearer of the word only, but a doer of the word. Because remember, if you're a hearer only, what? You deceive yourself. Interesting, right? The devil doesn't even have to deceive you. You do it yourself. So when God says in his word that you ought to forgive those who have harmed you and you harden your heart and say, well, I'm not going to forgive them. Pastor, you don't even know, you don't know what they did to me. Well, if it's beyond God's forgiveness, don't tell me. <laughs> but it isn't. Because God took the worst of us and forgave us through Christ. And he says, now you reach out and forgive. So that's just one example. That I can say, you know what? If the Lord shows me I'm to do that, then that's what I'm going to do. So we need uh, to walk close to the Lord, the Holy Spirit. I want to close here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Because we're warned against being deceived by others. Got to be careful, draw near to the Lord. We're warned about self-deception. Be doers of what God's word tells us to do and not just hearers only. But there's another aspect of deception I want to just give you before we close. And that has to do with God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9. Paul says, is speaking here about the Antichrist in the end time, and he says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, if I say this reason, here it is. God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. That they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. What is Paul saying here? He's saying in the last days there's going to come a delusion that God is going to bring. Obviously Satan is the deceiver. But God is going to allow people. To be deceived as a judgment. Why? Because they refuse the love of the truth. When God reveals truth. And you reject it. The only thing that can happen to you now. Is deception. Someone said, and I believe it's true, people who don't want the truth but want to have their ears tickled, the Bible says in the last days, people will look for teachers who will preach what they want to hear. Not what God says, but what I want to hear. And I heard a man say this, and I, and I think it's, and I, but I believe it's the truth, I believe it's scriptural, and here Paul says as much. False teachers, he said, are a judgment on God, of God on people who don't love the truth. False teachers are God's judgment. You don't want the truth? Okay, here, listen to these guys or these people. And people will be deceived because they listen to the wrong thing. Jesus warned us against, in the last days against false prophets and against false teachers. As a matter of fact, he told us that many of them will keep people from entering the kingdom. Why? Because when they hear truth, they reject it. So never be a truth rejecter. Remember, God is not mocked. So when you hear the truth and you hear the scripture and you hear the spirit of God tell you, this is what you need to do. Don't reject it. Because the only thing that you can get after rejecting truth is a lie. And God, the Bible says here, is going to send these people who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. He's going to send this delusion 
this deception upon them and they will not escape. It is a judgment. Thank God that we have the truth in scripture and we don't have to fall under that because we love the truth. And say, God, Jesus said, sanctify them in your truth, Father. Your word is truth. And I want to close with Hosea 10, 13. Look up here on the screen. Hosea 10, verse 13. This is what the Lord said. You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies. That's deception. Because you trusted what? In your own way. You trusted your own way. You've eaten the fruit of lies. The quickest way I know to get deception is to abandon God's way and do it your way. <laughs> All right? And so God says, listen, I've given you the spirit, my spirit placed within you. It is the spirit of truth. And it will always bear, bear witness to truth and it will always lead you to the truth. And that's why it's so important to develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit. More and more as I pray, I said, Lord, show me, reveal yourself to me. Reveal your, your glory to me. I want to see your glory, not mine, not ours, but yours. And uh, Jesus prayed that of the Father, the glory which I had with you, Lord, restore to me that I had with you before the world was. Uh, Jesus said, prayed this in John 17, Father, I pray that these, talking about his disciples, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. You see, that ought to be, I believe, the desire of every Christian. I want to see, the, I want to see Jesus in his glory. I want, I want to see him more and more as he is, because the more I look at him, the more I'm transformed to be like him. The more I see Jesus and how he lives and how he acts and talks. And I said, that's what I'm called to be like, Lord, help me. And whenever I find myself responding in the flesh, I need to despise that as much as I can. Even if it's in me. And say, Lord, help me. Forgive me. Help me to be able to bear the image of Christ inside of me. Because when we get to heaven, folks, there's not going to be any... Sin, there's not going to be any wickedness, there's not going to be any unrighteousness. It's going to be a place where only righteousness dwells. And so right now, we're in a time of practice and test, aren't we? <laughs> because I guarantee you, if you don't love righteousness, you're going to hate heaven. <laughs> right? And if you don't love righteousness, you'll never enter there. I, I'll leave you with this, you know, we're going to a place, the Bible says, we're in righteousness dwells. There will be no more lies there, no curse, no death. Think about a place where everybody does right all the time. If you can imagine such a place, because we don't know it. We've never experienced a place like that, have we? Where everyone does right all the time. That is the place that God has prepared for us. Well, you don't have to watch your back to see. You don't have to watch, you know, what they're going to say about you. Or, praise God. It's a place that honors God all the time. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight. We take the warnings of Scripture seriously. We take your warning, Lord, seriously. You said, be careful. Take heed that you be not deceived. And Lord, we want to be reminded that you have commanded us in your word to obey you because you are Lord. And you said that as we do the word, as we obey you, we are building a house so that when the storm comes, it will be able to stand. I pray for each and every one of us here today, Lord, if there is conviction that has come to our heart in an area, Lord, may May we repent of it and put it aside because you said we're to put aside all bitterness and envy and malice and anything, God, that stains our life with sin. And thank you for the Holy Spirit that you placed inside of us to lead us to righteousness, 
to lead us to live a life that is pleasing to you. Thank you for dying for us, Lord, that your blood may take away our sin. And if you paid such a great price, Lord, how can we despise it and live below that which you've made available to us? The holiness and righteousness of Christ manifested in our life. And so help us, Lord, to honor you in all that we do. Keep us from any deception, from others or personal. And let us know, Lord, when we need a hard examination, that we may honor you in all things. Go with us as we leave tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.